University would like to welcome all of you to tonight's web presentation, Horse Confirmation and Selection, with Dr. Kathy Anderson from the University of Nebraska. The web presentation will last approximately one hour. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat text throughout the presentation. However, make sure that your questions pertain to the information that Dr. Anderson is discussing. We will also have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for question and answers. If there are any questions that are typed into the text chat that Dr. Anderson is not able to get to, My Horse University will be sending out an email to all of you with the answers to those questions. The presentation will conclude at approximately 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before we get started, please allow me to give you some background information on Dr. Anderson. Dr. Kathy Anderson has been the Extension Horse Specialist at the University of Nebraska since 1991. She oversees the Youth and Adult Extension Horse Program as well as teaches undergraduate courses in the Animal Science Department. Kathy currently teaches courses in horse management, equine reproduction, and equine nutrition. Additionally, she has coached the UNL Horse Judging Team, an avid horse jo show judge. Kathy is carded judge with the American Quarter Horse Association, American Paint Horse Association, and National Snaffle Bit Association. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Animal Science and Agricultural Education from the University of Nebraska, Master's of Science in Physiology of Reproduction from Texas A&M University, and a PhD in Animal Science from Kansas State University. Along with her educational background, Dr. Anderson stays highly involved in the industry. Previously, she was an assistant trainer and breeding manager at a large quarter horse farm with her family. They currently raise and show Western Pleasure horses. She is past board member of the Quarter Horse Association of Nebraska, is the current vice president of the American Youth Horse Council, and the vice chair of Extension Horse Quest Project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathy Anderson. Okay, can you all hear me now? I think she switched the microphone over to me, and so, um, yeah, somebody would let me know to make sure that um, I'm coming across. And again, I'd like you to welcome you to this um, web presentation. Uh, it's the first one I've done like this, and so it's kind of exciting to share some information with folks from all across the country. And so I'll go ahead and get started on the presentation, um, make sure I'm going the right direction. Let's see. Okay, here we go. And the basics of this presentation is about confirmation um, and selection of horses. And I'm going to base a lot of this information on a phrase that we use and we say that uh, that uh, that you might have heard quite a bit called form to function. And we all know as horse people that um, for many of us, you know, the basic use of the horses is what's going to be the ultimate. When you look at a horse, um, if you get a trained eye, a learned eye, no matter what the breed, no matter if you're dealing a draft horse, a stock horse, um, a, a pinto, a gated horse, um, no matter what the breed, some of the basics of good confirmation is going, going to apply across the board. And so we don't all want halter horses, um, we don't all want reining horses, we don't all want pleasure horses, but having a good basic understanding of how the functionality of a horse and how they're put together all will help dictate how well that horse is going to be able to perform and move is going to be pretty important and pretty critical. <clears throat> all right. When we teach about confirmation, we really look at all of these various areas as far as what is important when doing an overall confirmation evaluation. And we'll spend a little bit of time on each of these. And so, um, especially when I would uh, work with the judging teams and they all had to give oral reasons and things such as that, the different areas that we'll evaluate any horse on would include their balance, their muscle, uh, their overall structure, the horse's quality and refinement, their breed and sex characteristics, and then also their travel and how they move and the way of going. And we'll go into each of those as we go through this evening's presentation. 
if you read some of the current rule books, they will even have even put into some of the rule books, particularly I'm, I'm with the, the quarter horse rule book, they'll talk about balance. And balance for most people will be, should be the foundation of how you look at a horse. And again, it doesn't matter if you're looking for a pleasure horse, a roping horse, a cart horse, no matter what you're looking at, a quarter horse, an Arabian, a draft horse, the basics that make up the balance of a horse should all be somewhat similar. And the idea of balance, <coughs> excuse me, is really that we're looking at that horse is made in proportion to himself. And so on this diagram here, the picture we've added some lines to, what we really look to see, and one way that I evaluate balance, is that the length of their shoulder here should be the same length as the length of their back, and that length should also be equal to or the same as the length of their hip. And those are one, the first three areas that we will look and evaluate balance on, their shoulder, their back, and their hip. And those are just part of where we'll evaluate their balance. In addition, some areas, other areas that we want to evaluate the balance on in relationship to the length of shoulder, back, and hip is also the horse's neck. <coughs> Excuse me. The neck should actually be equal to or longer than that horse's shoulder, back, and hip. So the length here should be the same. Excuse me. The length here should be the same, equal to or longer than this length of his shoulder, his back, and also their hip. In addition, we look to the top to bottom ratio of that horse's neck. And we prefer the top line of that horse's neck here to be almost in a two to one ratio as related to the bottom, uh, the underneath portion of that horse's neck here. Meaning that the top line here from his pole to his withers should nearly be twice as long as what we're looking at from the throat, throat latch to where it ties in underneath his neck. And that would be ideal. Remember, we never run into the ideal horse, but some of these are some of the types of things that, that we look at when we're evaluating overall balance. In looking at the head, the head also plays into the horse's balance. We would like the length of his head, this blue line here, to be the same length of this shoulder, back, and hip, or a little bit shorter. All right. So a short head is always a preferred head. A really long, really he really lo an excessively long head would not necessarily would be more of a detriment from the overall balance of that ho of the appearance of that horse. In addition, a few other areas that we look to evaluate balance is that the length of this horse's back here from the point <coughs> from his withers to the point of his hip here should be shorter than the length of their underline, which we would look at from behind their elbow here through their flank region here. So we want a horse that's shorter in his back than what he is in relation to his underline. Our next area of looking at balance is looking at the depth of their heart girth. So we're looking at the length from the point of the withers here down to the bottom of their belly right behind their forearm for that depth of heart girth and this length should be the same as the length from underneath their belly down to the ground. So that is another area that we will look to evaluate balance. So we're looking at the length of their shoulder, back, and hip to be equal the same as or longer to be equal. In addition, we're looking <clears throat> in addition, we're looking at that the length of their neck should be the same as those distances or a little bit longer. The head should be the same or a little bit shorter. Then in addition, we're looking for a shorter back in relationship to their underline. And then also we're looking at is the length of their heart girth the same as the length from underneath their belly down to the bottom of the ground. Now if we look at these two horses I have pictures of here and are just looking at overall balance, they are very different horses. The horse on this side here is a halter horse, so his function and purpose is going to be different than this horse here, which um, is basically a riding horse, a pleasure horse, just, just a horse to ride and use. If we look at the overall balance of these two horses when we're evaluating the length of the shoulder, the back, and the hip, this horse is fairly well balanced. In my opinion, he may be a little bit long in his back. However, if you look also to the length of his neck, he does have a very long neck, which is in proportion to the shoulder, to the back, and to the hip. In addition, if we look to the top line of his neck, to the underline ratio of his neck, he does to ha appear to have nearly a, a longer top line than he does on the underneath section. 
In addition, if we look at the balance of this horse from the length of his back in relation to his underline, here is where he lacks a little bit of his balance. All right? To me, this horse is a little bit long in his back. There's not as big a difference in the t in through his back and his underline as what we saw in the previous roan horse that I just showed you. However, if we look at the balance from his heart girth, from the, his withers to the underneath, uh, underneath his belly, and from the belly down to the bottom of the ground, he is fairly well balanced there. In contrast, if we come over here to this mare, when we look at the length of her shoulder in relationship to the length of her back, in relationship to the length of her hip, this mare to me falls off in her balance because she is very long in her back, much longer backed than the bright sorrel horse on the opposite side. She's extremely long in her back, quite short in her shoulder, and quite short in her hip here. However, if we look to the length of her neck, this mare, as far as length of her neck, um, is longer than those other areas. But if you look at the top line ratio to the underneath section portion of her neck, she um, does not have quite as close a 2 to 1 ratio as the other horse on this side does. In addition, when we look at the length of her back here in relationship to her underline, she still may be a bit longer over her back than she is in her underline. However, uh, she is closer to being equal in those distances than we would like to see. But then also when we look from the depth of her heart girth here to that to the ground, she is a fairly deep hearted kind of horse. Um, <clears throat> and so this horse is probably not going to be as well proportioned. The length of her back is, could cause her some problems as far as being able to carry herself in a very collected manner and some of those types of things. Here's a few other horses that we can look and evaluate balance on, right? Just to give you a few other examples, again, we're looking at their shoulder, their back, and their hip. <clears throat> and again, to me, this horse, her withers are set far, fairly back, um, but to, to me, this horse is maybe not as well balanced as we look at all those various areas of this horse here, okay? Look at her shoulder, her back, her hip, look at her neck, the depth of her heart girth to the ground, <clears throat> and the, the ratio of her, of her back to her underline. And so you should be able to begin to see some differences of balance um, between these, these different horses that we're showing. And any good horse, when you first walk up to a horse, it's good to kind of take an eye, take a look, and just general, do a general overview of those horses to give you a quick view of which one appears to be more balanced, and then watch them track and watch them move and see how the um, different areas or see how that comes together when you also ask them to move. In moving to the next category, the next area that we look at horses at is muscling. And you will see tremendously differences in horses muscling as you move from different types within a breed. Say in our stock horse breeds, we have um, reining horses, cutting horses, pleasure horses that maybe are not on the average as heavily muscled as some of our halter horses or other types of horses. When you between, move between breeds such as your draft horses, your Arabians, you will see quite a bit of different muscling between those different horses. But in general, if you're looking at muscling, we, we will evaluate them from the side um, and also from the front. Really, you probably get a better evaluation of the amount and type of muscling these horses have from the front than you do from the side. But if we're looking at these horses from the side, remember we're mainly focusing on the amount of muscling, we'll look here through their shoulder, we'll look here through their forearm, in addition we'll move back to their hip and we're mainly looking at the amount of muscling that they have through the hip and stifle region and down here through their gasket. This is kind of a moderately to light muscle kind, kind of mare here. When we look at her in front, what we're looking in the front is how much muscling they have in their forearm region in this here area here on the outside and the inside. In addition, we're looking to see how well they V up, how much this muscling ties down and carries down through their front legs here and in this we look for an inverted V in this area here and what they have in what we call the pectoral region all throughout here. <clears throat> 
And it's not that we want these horses to be real heavily muscled. Um, this is a little pleasure horse and she's very adequately muscled and good quality of muscling for what her purpose and her function is. So it's not to say that you want, sometimes we do not want a horse that has a lot of big bulgy and bulging muscles because sometimes it might impair their movement and not make them as free and long, free strided as a horse that just has an adequate amount of muscling. When we look at them from behind, we want them wider through their stifle than up at the point of their hip here. We like to see some expression of muscle through their hip region and we like to see a good amount of muscling or an equal amount of muscling on the outside of their gaskin as we do on the inside. Remember the strength and the power for those horses come from their muscling and particularly from behind. And so here's another diagram of showing you looking at that horse um, from the rear where we want them to have um, a have more muscling and be wider as we say from their stifle region than we do up here at the point of their hip. In addition we want them to have an equal amount of muscling on the inside of their gaskin as we do on the outside. Now granted, we do not want all these horses to be big bodybuilders. We probably do not want them all to be extremely heavily muscled, but you have to remember that the strength and the power and the correctness of gaits is all assisted and aided by a good quality of muscling and an adequate amount of muscling. Now naturally you'll have quite a bit of differences between breeds, but still where you're going to look and evaluate the muscling on these horses is really going to be pretty similar as you move across the different breeds and also horses for different disciplines. <clears throat> to look at a few horses with a little bit of differences, um, this is the, the, the painting from Oren Mixer that AQHA uses more or less as their ideal horse. And you can see how he exemplifies when you look at this horse from the side, the amount of quality, long type of muscling and quality of muscling you can see through this horse's shoulder and through his forearm. In addition, as you move back through his hip, okay, through his hip region, and down here through his stifle and his gaskin. And so although you're not seeing him in front and behind, you can still tell that this horse has quality muscling. It's long muscling. It ties in nice and long and deep into his joints. It's not overly um, bulging or, or, or bunchy kind of muscling. <coughs> this is a five-year-old quarter horse mare over here that um, is very adequate in her muscling. It's a little bit picture taken a little bit further away. She doesn't show you the expression and ripple of muscle that the, the diagram of three bars does. However, you can still see that she's got adequate muscling through her shoulder, in here through her forearm, back here through her hind leg um, to perform an adequate job. No, she is not a, 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 uh, a halter horse, but this is a, a, another riding horse that's very adequate in the kind of muscling that she has. Here's another horse just to look at that I considered more or less a moderately muscled horse. All right, This actually is a 21-year-old mare, so you can see that she's in tremendously good shape for her, um, for her age. And you can see that this mare from the side, some nice expression of muscling in here through her shoulder. She's got, looks to have some good um, expression and volume through here, through her forearm. Likewise, in here through her hip. <coughs> excuse me, through her hip, um, has some good muscling and down here through her lower and through her stifle and gaskin region. If you take this mare and look at her in front where we like to look, um, look th in here through her, uh, through her forearm, in here through her pectoral region and how this mare V's up, she probably has a little bit more muscling and good quality of muscling more so than the little sorrel mare that I showed you in one of the first slides. All right, She um, shows some str strength and stuff here, which is the type of muscling that's going to enable her to perform, however still not be so bulky and bulgy that would get in her way from the way that we would like her to track and travel and to move. In addition, down here on this um, hind view of this same mare, it's a little difficult to see, but she is um, a bit wider down here through her stifle than she is up at the top of her hip. You can see some muscle lines, some expression down here through her hip and her quarter region. In addition, she says you can see some nice muscling both on the outside and on the inside. So we considered her more or less somewhat of a moderately muscled kind of horse. 
<clears throat> Moving to one that, that I consider a fairly light muffled type of horse, um, when you look at the skelding from the side, um, he shows a lot of nice qualities to him, but maybe not have, doesn't show as much through here in his shoulder, and you probably really don't appreciate um, the degree of muffling that he has until you look at this horse in front and behind. Okay, his You can see here, however, in his form, it almost just goes straight up from his knee. You don't see much um, additional muscling or flaring out of his front leg and same back here through his hind leg. Where you can really see some of the differences is in this horse when you look at him in front or behind. All right, If you look through the chest of this horse, Okay, he's fairly broad here. His legs come out of the sockets off on the side. There's not much muscling in here through his inner forearm or his outer. And that palomina mare on the previous slide had more of a V that tied in deeper through here, whereas this horse, he more or less looks like he's got two sticks of a leg coming out of his, both sides of his shoulder. In addition, if you look at this horse from behind, and we look to see, is he wider through his stifle, this area here, than up at the point of a, his hip? And I would say probably not. He's a little bit more even, so he's not as deficient or devoid as some horses, because this is almost even from the point of his hip. Um, you will see some horses that actually this caves in and they're extremely light down here through his stifle. And this horse is more even, okay, so he's not as devoid as you might see of some horses. In addition, as you move down here through his stifle, you can see he's pretty light. Not a whole lot of muscling down here through there. Now, although he's not a powerhouse of a muscled horse, it's one of those things that we're going to take into account and look at the entire package. I've showed you three differences or a couple differences of muscling in horses, and the degree that you're want, going to want is just going to be all part of the package if you're looking for a horse to ride, a horse to perform, and do various types of things. Uh, the horse I'm showing here now, the buckskin horse, he would not do very well in most halter classes because muscling is a big criteria in a halter class. The Palomino mare that I showed you um, in her younger days, she probably was somewhat competitive in some of the halter classes. But if you're looking for a riding horse, don't get carried away on how much muscling they have. Take it as a note. Look at it as a part of the entire package that you're looking for when um, you're looking to purchase or find a horse because this horse I can tell you even though he's fairly light muscled, um, he can perform his job as a nice all around horse um, quite well uh, and, and gets along just fine. <clears throat> all right. Moving to another area that we look at um, in horses is their overall structure. There is a lot that goes into looking at the overall structure of your horse. And this is a lot where the form to function comes into play. Because this really entails everything that we look at about how a horse is put together. So yes, evaluation of balance is probably a, a function of their overall structure, but we do like to separate balance out because it's showing that the horse is evenly proportioned amongst himself. All right. So to walk through some different things with structure, and in structure we're going to look at the head, the throat latch, the neck, the shoulder, the slope of the shoulder, um, the levelness of top line, how their legs are hooked on, the shape of their hip, and all of those things come into play when we're basically, basically looking at the overall structure of the horse. So we'll more or less go from head to toe and first look at the horse's head, their throat, the first look at the horse's head, their throat latch, and their neck. And we already said as far as balance that we like the head to be relatively short. Um, Many old timers say that you don't ride the horse's head. However, there are a lot of functional things as far as why we want their horse's head to be shaped and put on the way that we do with a large nostril, a large eye, width between their eyes. Um, also moving into the throat latch, a tight and small throat latch is very desirable because it gives the horse more athletic ability to be able to flex at the pole, bend their head and those types of things. Also, if there's not extreme amount of thickness through there, they actually have more air passage um, in there through their throat latch. In addition with the neck, we already talked about the two to one ratio of top line to bottom line. We also look to see that the neck ties in deep and high and or ties in um, deep to the horse's withers and how that neck comes in and ties in between the horse's front legs. 
We'll show you a little bit more on some head and necks of some horses. And looking at some of the things with the horse's basic head, neck, and eyes. We always say that we want large eyes that are set out wide on the horse's um, head because that's going to increase their field of vision. This horse is what we would call a pig-eyed horse. He's got little bitty eyes. Yes, they're set out to the side, but they're little, little bitty eyes. A pig-eyed horse will tend to be one that is a little bit more nervous, a little bit more fractious, because he simply cannot see things as well as a horse that has large eyes, such as this mare or this one, that are set out, out wide. Your pig-eyed horses might tend to be a little bit more high-headed. They might be a little bit more nervous. Not to say don't ever buy a pig-eyed horse, but just realize that his field of vision is not going to be as well as one with larger eyes. A big-eyed horse can still be nervous and shy from things, so that's not your only criteria. <clears throat> Okay, when we look at, um, remember the way a horse sees, um, he's going to see by what we call um, the type of vision where he sees different things out of each eye, and so that's really why we like those eyes to be out set wide on their head um, and nice and large. When you move down to the nostril, we like the horse's nostril to be nice and large, again, for good air passage, but if you get real picky, a lot of folks would prefer lips that are, are smaller um, or more refined than one that has a big, thick kind of course with his lip. Right. If you look at this mare, she's got a nice big eye that's set off to the side. Some other real good desirable characteristics about this mare is that she's extremely clean through her throat latch um, and clean out here through her neck. And so this mare is going to have a lot of flexion, a lot be able to give it her pull, bend her heads about um, right and left, and those types of things. Uh, and um, be pretty, have mobile in, in her neck. I see that we have a question down here about posterior behind and function, and that I'll address a little bit as we move into, um, get a little bit further into structure. And if I don't answer it as well for you, remind me again, but as we move through structure um, and the hind leg uh, placement or hind leg, I'll, I'll try to address that to some degree. All righty. Okay, here's some differences of head and necks um, and how they're placed on those horses. This is the roan horse that I showed you before. This horse has some big eyes, a relatively short head. Again, she's relatively clean through her throat latch here, which is a very attractive and more athletic type of throat latch. Again, this horse's um, neck comes in and ties in well back on her withers, and it also comes in and ties in high between her chest. Uh, I'll get to it here in a minute, but the other thing that is a strong desire is that we have a horse that has a nearly 45 degree angle to their shoulder, and also that shoulder matches the angle of their pasterns. If they have this good shoulder, then the neck will tie in higher between those front legs. The sloping shoulder and the neck that comes in good are also indicative of a horse that will have a longer stride and be softer with his front leg, flatter in his knees. In addition, he's going to be a sounder horse because there's less wear and tear down there on the joints um, and the elastic structures in his front legs. So all of these, these things tie in and work together. Here's a horse to me that is just a coarser bay type of horse. Um, he's uh, he's a bit longer, um, not as uh, expressionate in his head, you might say. You can see the difference of throat latch in this horse versus this, and he's a bit thicker in here through his throat latch. He's fairly decent with his shoulder, um, but his neck does tie in here deeper and closer between his legs, front legs, not as high as this horse on this side does. All right. This is a horse that I really like to pick on, and I use her a lot as far as some examples of throat latch and head and neck and straight shoulders. If you look at the angle of this horse's shoulder, it's very, it's um, it's quite a bit more up and down than the shoulder on either this horse or this horse over here. In addition, you can see the withers are set forward, and this horse's neck comes in and ties way down here between her chest. This also, um, you can see that her, her um, withers appear to be set way up on her neck, where she almost has a little bit of a humpback um, appearance to her. This horse is one, um, because of her shoulder uh, 
orientation, was always a mare that was very elevated in her knees, um, ha and she will be shorter strided, uh, more elevated in her knees, and also has a has um, would be more prone to to some front leg types of um, lamenesses and sorenesses as time goes on if she has a lot of wear and tear um, because of her upright shoulder and also her upright pastures, which you're not able to see on this picture here. <clears throat> All right, so I've alluded a little bit on the horse's shoulder, and we would really ideally like a horse's shoulder that is nearly a 45 degree angle, which is going to be indicative if their withers are set back on their neck and the angle is a nice and 45 degree angle. If We also would like that shoulder to be the same as the angle down here through that horse's foot. When a horse has that long sloping shoulder, his withers are going to be set further back on his back, which is going to combine the way that the neck will come in and tie in and the longer top line over the neck. In addition, a horse with a good shoulder will generally have a, the underneath of the neck that ties in deep, excuse me, ties in high between his front legs. These are horses that will use their shoulders to a greater degree when they travel. They will tend to be horses that are longer strided and more efficient and about their movement and also have, have, a, have a flatter front leg, be sounder and softer with the way they move, and a longer stride than one that's upright in a shoulder. Okay, when you have this good shoulder, the withers are going to be laid back, then those horses in addition will tend to have a shorter back. And those will all go <clears throat> along. Um, will all go along together. When we move back to the horse's hip, all right, you'll have different um, shapes of those horses' hip. And I've stuck a little box on this horse's hip, and because ideally for most horses, we. We, they're asking who is this horse. Um, frankly, he's a picture of a halter horse that I stole out of a magazine because I thought he was nice. And so I can't remember and tell you exactly what his name is because I've used this picture for some years. Um, some of the others I do know, and I can I can tell you those if you're interested in those. But yes, he's he's he probably was a fairly well-known halter horse. Only this is taken out of um, taken from an ad that was in some of the magazines a few years back. Um, so we like the length of the hip to be somewhat of a boxy type of shape because, again, what this is going to give you is a lot of muscle and power down here through the stifle region. Uh, in addition, with the croup, this area here, we say we want it to be um, nicely turned over as croup. And somebody asked, is he Sunny D bar? I do not believe so. I think Sunny D bar had four white socks. So I don't believe it's as, is that this is who that is. Anyway, as far as with the croup, we like them to be nice, somewhat turned over their croup. In the stock horse breeds, we do not want them ex excessively flat over their croup region here. <laughs> um, let's see. That's with their hip. And I'll show you some differences of some orientation of their hip here in just a minute. Someone had a question about the set to their hind legs. And you will see different. Uh, disciplines and different breeds and, and some arguments as far as the set to the hawk. To me, this horse has a nice set to his hawk where it comes out with a little bit of an angle and then we want from the point of the hawk the cannon bone to go down, down straight. Ideally, we'd like a line that you could drop from the point of their hip through their hawk and go down to the ground. This leg is offset just a little bit for, for um, photographic reasons, but this horse has a fairly nice set to his hawk. You will see some halter horses today that are extremely posty in their hocks. You will see some pleasure horses that are extremely straight up and down in their hocks. Problems with horses that are excessively straight up and down in their hocks is you will tend to get more injuries and problems in the stifles and in the hocks. And I'll show you some differences of horses that have are, who, whose hocks are set too far out behind them in a few pictures um, as we come on through the presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. With the front leg, in addition, we like it to come down and straight underneath the horse. Ideally, we should have a line that would come down and bisect through their forearm, through their knee, come down through their ankle, and then the back of the heel um, is underneath itself. So that horse's leg is right underneath itself. In addition, we would prefer a horse that has more length up here in his forearm and is shorter in his cannon bone. Because a short cannon, um, a 
a, a long forearm short cannon horse is going to be one that will tend to be a little bit sounder horse um, as he goes through a lot of wear and tear. In addition from behind we like them to be relatively low in their hocks and not real high, high in their hocks. Okay, this shows you another example of what we call the hoof pasture axis, where axis as where we like to see the angle of their shoulder to be the same as the angle uh, down here through their pasture, okay, through their foot. In addition, you like to look, and it's kind of small and difficult to see here, that um, the the line that runs through their through on the parallel here is the same as one that runs, runs through their heel. So all of these column of bones are aligned correctly. But ideally we have an equal and the same um, angle of the shoulder as we do down here through, uh, through their, their pastern. Okay, here's a few horses that we'll kind of pick on for general structure. This is this roan horse that we've been looking at before. And you can see the shape of this mare's hip is fairly in the square shape um, as compared to the chestnut mare over here. This mare um, is very light down here through her stifle, so she has a little bit more of what I call somewhat of a triangle shape to her hip, where this has, although she's not as, as heavily made as the halter horse, a little bit of a more square kind of hip. In addition, you can see the croup region of this mare turns off real slightly, whereas this mare over here, her croup is much more steep. If you want to look at, and this mare is a little bit at an angle, the orientation of this horse's hock, and this leg is standing out behind, but you can even see, although the the, it is placed out behind her, the angle and the set to her hock is allowing it to be more underneath herself than I would say the chestnut mare over here. This mare has more angle to her hock where it's out behind her. This mare, when we rode her, always did have problems of her hind legs staying out behind her. This was a reigning mare and she never, they all, part of the reason she was donated to the university is that, that she um, had trouble sliding because her hind end would not stay underneath itself. In addition, the way her shoulder and neck were, um, she had some, some problems with some of her athleticism with doing that also. Uh, you can see that this mare, as far as her front leg standing underneath herself, is very nice and very correct. This mare also, her front leg underneath herself is just fine. My main criticisms of this mare when we're looking at her structure are the shape of her hip. It's a very light type of hip. Um, the set to her hock is more out and more angled uh, than what we would like to see as comparison to this mare over here. <coughs> Also another area that we're going to look at is over their top line and you'll see a lot of breeders talk about horses and how well they are and strong over their top line, which is basically looking at this area through here. We like a horse that is the same height from their withers to the point of their hip and nice and strong over out, out over their back. You have to remember that young horses grow uh, hip first and then withers. So if you're looking at a yearling, a two-year-old, maybe even a three-year-old, and they're a little higher in their hip, that should not concern you very much. Um, however, if it's a 10, 11-year-old horse and he's higher in his hip than he is at his withers, that's probably not going to change. That's probably the way that horse is. So those horses would be considered a little rough over their top line. If they're really low and weak in their back, that also would be something that would take away from their the orientation of how their top line um, and how smooth they are, how well they can carry themselves, and the shape of their hip, their placement of their hock are all going to play into how well the horse can bring this hind leg underneath and run, canter, lope, whatever you want them to do in a very collected manner. So when we're looking at movement of the horse, we're going to look a lot at the horse's shoulder and front leg for how that horse's front leg is going to be oriented. Does it have a long sloping shoulder? Does it have a deep heart girth? How does the neck shoulder junction come into play? And that will help a horse trot and move out of their shoulder and be having a long sweeping stride with what we call a flat knee. And really that is very desirable in many of your disciplines. To look for how well they're going to carry themselves behind, we'll look at the shape of their hip, the way the hock comes on and ties onto that horse's leg, and a good horseman can see this orientation and predict when that horse walks how far this hind leg is going to come up underneath themselves. Horses that leave their hind legs out behind them are never going to be able to be quite as collected and use their hind ends to the degree as one that can track up and carry that hind leg up underneath themselves. 
Okay, I like to pick on this horse. Um, to be honest, he's my daughter's horse, so I can do that. And there are some structural things about this horse that are very good to observe and see. And because I know this horse, I can relate that to the way that this horse moves. As far as structure, you, what I would say is this horse is more up and down in his shoulder than what we would like to see. He's got some slope, but it is not that true 45 degree angle. So that ties into, can you see how this horse's neck comes in deep between his front legs? And he almost has more length here than he does over the top line. All right, And this is, again, our fairly light-muscled horse. He's fairly deep through here. However, he's more up, up and down with his shoulder than what we would consider ideal. This horse, he's not that old. He's about 10. He is fairly level from here to here. However, he is a little bit low and weak in his back. However, the shape of his hip, we like the shape of his hip. We like the way that this hock and hind end um, causes him underneath himself. This horse, I can tell you, pretty much travels true to form. He is a not bad, but he does carry his knees or, or is a little bit um, has a little more knee action than what you might like to see in a really top level horse. However, the benefit of this horse is he is very good with his hind end. When he lopes, his hocks come up very deep underneath himself. So as you can see, there is no perfect horse. And this horse is, I would prefer a horse that is very deep in his hock and can bring his hock underneath himself and lope really deep than one and, and compromise his shoulder just a little bit than one that's perfect in front and has his hock out behind him. Because this horse can still track and travel and do a lot of very good things. And it's much harder to get a horse to perform um, in various ways and high levels if his hock orientation is not as correct. Um, and so I would prefer a good hocked horse over one um, than, than, and give a little bit on his shoulder, you might say. So to pick these two apart on some more evaluations of structure, this is a horse that we had looked at before. And again, she's somewhat upright in her shoulder. Uh, she's a, a horse that was fairly long on her back, so that lacks her balance some. She's kind of light in her hip. And you can see her hind leg, although it's difficult to see, is hung out behind her just a bit. This is a four-year-old gelding. Um, his front end is fairly nice. However, he is a bit up and down in his shoulder, fairly clean in his throat, and clean through his neck. This horse is nice and short in his back, short in his, or good um, in relation to his underline. He has a little bit of that triangle look to his hip, all right? And one of his biggest um, faults is that his, the way his hock is, this hind leg is out, and out behind himself. This horse tracked and was fairly nice in front. However, this horse always had some difficulty being able to lope, um, lope uh, really well because his hock was always out behind him just a bit. All right, um, I've picked apart this horse before, and so I think we'll just go ahead and move on to the next slide, because we've kind of talked quite a bit of structure on this particular horse also. Now here's some diagrams that will help show you the differences of the way that horse is going to pick up and set down his feet, which are related to their conformation. Right, this is our ideal horse here that would have a 45 degree angle to his shoulder and a 45 degree angle down here through his foot, through his hoof pastern. And these horses are going to have an even, easy um, foot flight pattern where it's going to be a nice, even arc. It's going to be a fairly long stride. And the way they step down is going to apply even concussion over that horse's foot and up through his legs of the tendons and ligaments. If we have a horse that has a long toe and underrun heel, and these may or may not be horses with upright pass, upright um, shoulders, this horse here is indicative of ones that do have really very upright shoulders, where we have um, a a more up and down um, uh, angle to their foot. Okay, this horse you can see is going to have a much shorter stride, and also much more wear and tear on his. Uh, elastic structures down here through his foot, um, down here in the navicular region, and the tendons and ligaments that go down the back of his foot. This horse, with his, he's going to have a long stride and up and then a stepping down stride. However, he too is going to have some pain back through in this region because it's not an even step down that he has down um, on his foot. 
Okay, when we also look at a little bit of their quality and refinement, and here's two horses you can see are very different. Um, quality and refinement as far as one of our other categories is really looking at the horse's overall general appearance. It takes into account how well their head and neck look together, the quality of their bone and muscling. Pretty easy to see that this horse here has a very high quality hair coat. Um, he's, he's got some quality to his legs, um, is a very attractive kind of horse. Um, I can certainly pick him apart confirmationally, but as far as the bloom and stuff that he has to the quality of his bone and his muscling, you, this horse catches your eye. I kind of went to a very drastic difference, um, and this is a, yes, it's an older photo. However, it is a horse that doesn't show much quality. He's very rough in his hair coat. He's fairly coarse in his head, coarse down there through his legs, um, and some pretty drastic differences of when you would just generally look at overall quality of that horse. In addition to quality, we also will look at um, in general confirmation evaluation, their breed and sex characteristics. And this is going to vary tremendously as you move between breeds and a little bit sometimes even within some breeds. Um, <clears throat> mares should look like mares, um, stallions like gal stallions, geldings like males. Um, we've got a POA here that's a very um, high quality type of horse, a draft horse down here, a Morgan here, and each breed will have their characteristics that are very um, indicative and unique to those particular breeds. However, some of the basic structural types of things um, and muscling and balance types of things are going to play the similar across the board from any discipline or any breed that you might be interested in. In addition, um, we will also need to, you also need to look and evaluate how well a horse moves, all right? Um, when you're looking for how a horse travels, you need to both look how they move in front. Do they pick their feet up straight um, or, or on the negative side? Are they narrow? Are they wide base and those types of things? Look at them track at you from behind. <clears throat> Again, are they straight? Um, do they pick their feet up? Are they narrow where they might hit each other and those types of things? Also, if some folks forget, look at how they track from the side. That will tell you how long their stride is, how they use their shoulders. Do they track up with their hind? legs. And then remember, various breeds, various disciplines, we've got some rope horses here, we've got a gated horse here, they're going to track and move very different. And so a person has to be familiar with what we would, what we would prefer and desire, depending on the purpose and the function for that particular horse. Jump back a little bit to quality here, um, and to me this is a horse that just is not as much quality as the buckskin gelding that I showed you, but certainly has a little bit more quality than, than the horse that was in the bottom of the picture. And again, you just stand back and have a general overall appearance. Um, he's a little rougher made kind of horse. He's a little bit coarser the way his muscling is put together, not quite as refined, and that's just part of the picket part of the package and part of the picture. So he might be perfectly fine and, and just great for the function and purpose that you might have for that particular horse. To finish up here with the last few slides, um, just a little bit on some other things. You know, we've gone through a lot as far as looking at their confirmation, trying to predict how they might move and travel for whatever you might want to use them for, depending on how they're functionally put together, what their confirmation is. But the other very, very critical factor is that horse is generally personality and their trainability. And they can't stand there in a halter class or stand there and look at them and be able to evaluate these types of things. Particularly if you're looking for a horse to ride, which many of us are, um, even if it's a horse that you're going to breed, they need to have you know, some trainability. They need to be able to handle. You want them to be a likable horse and a horse that's easy to get along with. And so to me, that horse's brain, their personality, um, how easy they are to, are to work with is very important. And you only learn those types of things of being around that horse. If it's one you're looking at to purchase or buy, you need to spend some time around that horse so you get to be familiar with how it acts, how it reacts, how it stands in the barn, does it stand tied up and all those types of things. Because to me that might be one of the very most critical things and you may be able to be satisfied or be not as um, particular on some things confirmationally if the horse is a right fit with his personality and the way he is.
So when you're looking to purchase a horse, some questions that you should go through is to make sure that you look and get what you want and try to stay true to your original plan. Many times folks start looking for horses and the horse they start thinking that they want and the horse they end up in purchasing can be very different. So it's very important that you stay focused and know what is important for what you want to get. Who's the horse for? Is it for your young child? Is it for an older person? Very important is how experienced is that rider? Um, are they are they able to handle a young horse? Or do they need one that is what we'd say bomb proof? Okay, be very honest about what you want the horse to do. I have many friends that they just want a horse to play with, and then the next thing you know, they're looking to go to the horse show, and they never sought out and bought the right horse because that was never an initial plan. In addition, you need to think about where you're going to keep it. Not just jump into it, but you need to have an idea of where it's going to live a boarding stable at your neighbor's house at your own place those are all very important things to think about when you're beginning to look for a horse in addition what's your price range and try to stay within that price range um, that you look at because you know it's it's going to be affordable remember that sometimes the purchase price is the cheapest part of the horse uh, you also have to care for it feed it do the veterinarian work do the farrier work and all those types of things so set up a budget and make sure that you know what you financially what you're truly getting into. And then where are you going to find that horse? There's newspapers, there are um, friends, there's other um, um, horse professionals in their area. So there's a lot of different options about where to find that horse and think about some of those things as you get, get going. Uh, trying to save a few minutes for questions here, so I only have a few slides left. This is a little phrase I learned one time, that green plus green can equal black and blue. And we see many times that a person is looking for a young horse for that young rider so they can grow up together. And that generally is not the very best plan. Um, so you need to be very honest with a person's ability and what horse is going to um, and what horse, what type of horse is going to meet that person's needs the best. Remember, just because they're 16, 17, 18 does not mean that they're a kid broke horse. Some horses are cranky, some horses have personalities that never make that really quiet kid broke kind of horse. So you really need to investigate um, you really need to investigate and find um, and know the personality of those horses that it does fit the type of, of rider that you're looking for. Um, be honest about what you want the horse to do. Do you want it to trail ride? Do you want it to show? Do you want it to go to a barrel race? Um, be pretty honest about those types of things and honest that um, each horse has a purpose and be sure that you're going to to find a horse for the purpose that you want them. It might be that you're hardly going to ride a horse, okay? These kids just wanted one to pet and play with, and that is all that they need that first horse to do. Um, and so it's, it's going to be perfectly functional for them. Not everyone's looking to go to the horse show, and so just be very honest about what it is that you're looking for. So my bottom line when it comes to horse shopping, my biggest things are to be patient and be honest about what you can afford and what you're going to use those horses for. And too many times people get frustrated and get in a hurry and so um, they end up purchasing something that doesn't really fit them. They think it's just pretty so that's why they want to buy that horse rather than finding out that it, the truly the functional use of that horse is really what's going to be the very most important. Um, thanks for your time and good luck as you're looking for horses. Um, let's see, there's a question down here and I'm not sure that I have an answer to this one. Regarding the hind end, they asked, and how does the angle of the sacral vertebrae from the joint to the duct affect speed if it does? I'm not sure if we can say an angle or that is going to affect a lot of speed. Speed. Um, it probably would affect a little bit on the length of the stride, which might probably is something of a function of the speed of the horse. Um, I'm not sure that I'm really going to have a good good um, answer to that. Um, a horse that is very very flat on their croup probably is going to be a, a more negative than one that is somewhat rounded, um, and I'm not sure you know if that helps your question or not. Um, I'm not going to have a really good answer for that one. Um, and as far as your copies of this presentation, I'll let Kate and the folks from um, MSU Global um, respond to that type, that type because um, that I can't help you with. 
we've got time for a few more questions. Um, you can go ahead and type those in. I hope that this has provided you some good insight as how to confirmation, look at a horse and try to make some decisions, um, some thoughts about how that horse might look and perform. To me, really, the, the biggest um, the biggest thing that you can do is, is um, you know, look at horses, watch them track, see their personalities. We've got another question about how to halter horse, how do the halter horse people increase muffling in their show horses? Um, part of that is genetics. Part of that is the breeding on those horses, and they will tend to just be that way. Part of it is the way that they condition and work them. They will work them in deep sand. Um, many of them, if you move to various places, will um, work them where they pony in behind um, different vehicles and stuff to help build them up. Uh, different types of training will help enhance um, certain areas of their muscling and those types of things. And so um, those are some different things that they do to enhance muscling on their horses. It's a combination of their exercise program. I think genetics is a big part of that, the way those horses are bred, um, and, and, and that is certainly a factor. Their feeding programs to some degree, but they have to be very careful in their conditioning programs that they work them somewhat as a bodybuilder. And there's certain exercises just as a human bodybuilder can do to increase certain types of muscle fiber types for their, for their size, and they'll do some of those similar types of things on some of those halter horses. Another person wants to know if she can send me a picture of her horse and get my thoughts. Sure, um, you could um, email them, um, probably email them to, to the gals at, at MSU and they'll email it to me. Uh, if you wanted an address, also through email, we can provide you that too. Kate says go ahead and email the pictures including thoughts and questions and she gives you the website um, that you have there or the, the email that you have there that you can send those on to. With that, um, unless there's no more quest questions, um, we'll go ahead and pull the close and, and wait to see if anything else pops up. Hope, it, hope you guys enjoyed this, and um, it was interesting and fun for me to put together, so appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thank you again uh, for attending tonight's web presentation. My Horse University will be holding web presentations once a month through the month of May. Uh, so please keep checking our website for more information on the upcoming presentations. Um, and I will type in our web present or our um, web address into the text chat for you to get access to that. If you have any questions or comments about tonight's presentation, uh, please feel free to email us at the website that was given at info at myhorseuniversity.com. Um, and also um, to answer Debbie's question about getting the web or getting the presentation at a later date, uh, My Horse University will be putting a link on our website uh, for you to um, you'll be able to hear the audio from the presentation and see the screenshots of the presentation. So you won't be able to do the text chat or have that interactive um, connection that we have now. However, uh, you will be able to view it at a later date. And um, at the current time, that is also going to be a free service to you. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, there is the uh, website that you can visit for more information. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Anderson. And if there are no other questions, um, we will bring the presentation to an end. Uh, the presentation will be You'll be able to see exactly the same PowerPoint presentation that Dr. Anderson showed tonight, um, and you'll be able to follow along with her audio. Um, the only thing that will be different is you won't be able to hear, um, uh, or I'm sorry, you won't be able to use the text chat, so there'll be nobody there to obviously um, chat with you or to interact like we are doing right now. Um, you will be able to download the presentation. There'll be a link on our website, so you can visit www www.myhorseuniversity.com and you'll click on the link and that'll take you right to uh, listen to the presentation and view the slides again. Uh, feel free, we have a couple more minutes, so anybody that's remaining here, feel free to type in any questions that you may have and if they're for Kathy, we can uh, put, that, put her back on as the speaker. Um,
And Mary, thanks for, <laughs> thank you for saying that. Yes, Mary um, has taken um, our courses. Um, so um, you, there, we currently do have two courses available for you to take. One is on confirmation and selection. Um, it's actually titled uh, Horse Selection and Evaluation, but we do talk about confirmation within that course. The other is uh, Horse Behavior and Welfare. Um, we are having a couple other courses come up here. One that's coming up shortly is um, equine nutrition. After that will be equine health and then we have some others that will be coming in 2008 and 2009. Feel free to check out our website uh, for that information as well. We also have a couple more items that are coming out that are on our website, uh, all worth looking at. Um, and I will give you that website again. Uh, there you go. Uh, the equine nutrition, that course, um, I'm going to say that um, all courses are tentative to, um, they're all tentative dates, which most courses are, so um, the scheduled date that we have for that will be in um, September. Um, so we're hoping to have that out by the end of this month, the beginning of next month. Of, again, please don't uh, hold me to it because all dates are always subject to change like most online courses. Um, but we are really optimistic and trust me that will be one that everybody will enjoy. So hope to see you all in there. Okay, this is a question for Kathy so I'm going to go ahead and switch it back over to you. Uh, you asked about it with a dressage horse. Um, to, to critical aspects for look for the dressage horse. Um, those horses go through a lot of work, a lot of wear and tear, and so um, I would say things with their good shoulder anatomy and the basics of balance, where you have a horse that has a good slope to his shoulder, um, that depth of heart girth, the short, strong back, um, and the way that his hip is tied on, to me are going to be very important for even a dressage horse because the types of um, performance and stuff that they're asking those horses to do. And I think it would be very difficult for a horse that is very up and down in his shoulders and that to perform at some of the types of, of um, maneuvers and things that, those, that they ask those horses to do. So I hope that helps you a little bit. Okay, I'm going to jump to um, the next presentation is going to be um, next month. We're going to do one presentation um, every month and um, I will actually, what I'll do because I want to give you the exact date, so I will switch this over back to Kathy um, and let you answer Diane's question and then I will um, get back about the exact date so you know exactly when that is. All that information will also be on our website um, so you can always look back there as well, but Kathy, I'll let you answer this next question. Oh. I see, I'm not completely sure about what you mean by co collaborate with Rutgers University of New Jersey. Is that uh, with their teaching program, or is that um, with some of the the web presentations? Is what they're having now. Um, I'm not sure. I completely understand what um, Diane is asking there. So, Diane, if you could give us a little bit more information, um, either Kate or I could probably answer your question just a little bit better. Um, going back briefly to the previous question, October, we are going to be doing a web presentation on October 23rd. Uh, the uh, person that will be presenting is Hal, and I believe you say his name as um, Schott, it's S-C-H-O-T-T, -T, and the topic is Cushing's disease. Uh, so that should be a very interesting and informative presentation as well. Um, again, that will be a free web presentation. You can get all the information on how to register for that on our website. Um, it's not currently up there right now, uh, but now that Dr. Anderson's presentation um, has passed. We'll go back um, and put that on there. Um, as far as a collaboration with Rutgers University in New Jersey, um, 
I don't believe that we currently um, are collaborating with them. Uh, that is a great question for our marketing team and what we can do is um, send that question um, on to them and that could be something that we email to everybody afterwards, um, a, a thorough answer on that. But uh, no, I don't recall um, seeing a collaboration with them, so I would have to say no, but I'll confirm that with our marketing department. And um, the, is the program also available on the UNL website? Um, the program that I am thinking, if, you, if you're speaking about um, My Horse University programs, those are not currently set up on the uh, University of Nebraska's website. Uh, you can um, get those by My Horse University's website. I'll turn that over to Dr. Anderson as well to expand on that. Oh, okay, I'm on. Um, Trish, uh, if you're asking about the program in general, um, for My Horse University, I'm working and collaborating some with the people from Michigan State. Um, at some time, we might do some stuff as far as with um, um, helping offer some of their courses. If you're asking about this presentation that we did this evening, um, I would have to visit with the folks from MSU. Um, it's probably just as easy to to get it off of their website, and we really hadn't investigated um, that type of thing right now. Well, again, I just would like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Kathy Anderson for doing a wonderful job on tonight's web presentation. Um, and again, would like to let everybody know you can visit our website at www.myhorseuniversity.com uh, to get information on upcoming presentations. Uh, feel free to email us um, at any time. You can email at 517, or I'm sorry, you can email at info at myhorseuniversity.com or you can give us a call Monday through Friday uh, 8 to 5 Eastern Standard Time and I will put the telephone number right in here. This is our client service department at My, uh, My Horse University. Uh, so any questions uh, you can have, send us an email or give us a call. Thanks so much and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. <laughs>